Welcome everyone. Welcome humans. Welcome some turkeys. Let's take a few deep breaths and arrive in this space together. Taking another minute. Feel your feet on the floor. Hear the sounds around you. Wow. And we have arrived. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Compassion Consortium. I'm Reverend Sarah Bowen, and I'm joined today by co-founders Victoria Moran and Reverend William Melton. And as always, Phil is navigating us through Zoom land. In order to make sure we don't have disruption during the service, we've turned off some of the Zoom sharing functions, but we look forward to seeing you and hearing your voices later during the fellowship time. We meet for Sunday service, the fourth Sunday of every month. If you're new to us, welcome. We are an interfaith, interspiritual, and interspecies community. Interfaith means we welcome people of any spiritual or religious tradition, philosophy, path, system of meaning making, and we feature a diverse range within our programming. Today, we'll be hearing about Zoroastrianism from Dr. Armighty May. Interspiritual means that we believe underneath all of those religions and traditions, there lies a commitment to three values, peace, compassionate service, and love for all of the earth. Finally, our community is interspecies, hence starting with the turkeys, which means we consider the lives and the needs of the many, many species we share the planet with while we're together and when we're not together too. At the beginning of each Sunday service, I usually offer an acknowledgement to bring our awareness to humans and other species who are indigenous to and currently present in whatever habitat I'm in. But since Friday was Native American Heritage Day, I'd like to invite each of you to consider now those who lived in your habitat before you and who may be struggling to live in your community now. I'm gonna place in the chat a link where you can type in your address. You can find out the names of the people around you. You can learn after the service about the complicated history of colonialism and settler indigenous relations and explore indigenous ways of knowing. It's a fabulous website. And if you don't already know, the land you're on. It can help you find out very quickly. And because Thursday was Thanksgiving here in the U.S., I'd also like to draw our attention to the complicated history of human-turkey relations. Where I live, that means eastern wild turkeys. During colonization, much of their natural habitat was destroyed when trees were cut down for timber and land was cleared for farming. On top of that, there were no hunting regulations at that time, so the turkey population dwindled quickly, actually disappearing from sight by the mid 1840s. About a hundred years later, they reappeared and the NYDEC tells me that's because some turkeys came from Western, uh, Northern Pennsylvania and came over into Western New York, bringing wild turkeys back to our space. So now I get to see wild turkeys frequently. When I first moved into my house and I saw one in the backyard, I didn't know it was a turkey. I had been conditioned in grade school only to recognize male turkeys and only when they had their plumage fully displayed. Does anyone remember having to draw a, turkle, a turkey with your hand and coloring in the fingers? That's what I thought a turkey looked like. When they showed up at my yard, I was confused. But when they became more visible to me, I fell in love with them. I started to care more about turkeys and all the other feathered beings that lived around me. And I learned that even though I usually see turkeys walking slowly through wooded areas, they can fly up to 55 miles per hour. Yes, they can fly. And they can run up to 12 miles per hour. I also learned that the turkey restoration here in New York was funded through hunting licenses and taxes on the sales of firearms, ammunition, and archery equipment. Does that surprise anyone? Because in fact, much of the money that goes to conserve and restore habitats in the United States 
comes from an excise tax that is levied on hunting equipment due to the Pittman-Robertson Act of 1937. Last year, this meant that over a billion dollars was raised for conservation on hunting equipment. The ethical quandaries of tying conservation funding to violence and guns are endless. And so if this is new news for you, I urge you to read up on this problem, as well as about the animals who are suffering on the government managed lands we call national and state parks. There's so much to dig into there. But I'll concede that most people who last week were offering me a gobble gobble or a happy turkey day were not thinking about the local amazing wild turkey population. No, they were celebrating their holiday meal. And every time they did so, my heart sank and my eyes teared up and my throat got a little scratchy. It's almost unbearable for me that we have a holiday so tied to the killing of a specific species. Last year when I did this service, I was in the Galapagos. I had fled the US for Thanksgiving, planning my vacation to be out of the country so I didn't have to be around what I consider nonsense, but is actually a deeply entrenched problem. This year I stuck around, I wrote my column for Spirituality and Health Magazine quite pointedly, asking people to please stop using gratitude to bypass violence and instead to engage in something I'm calling ultra gratitude. The practice starts with plant-based meals and then takes a broader view of how to be compassionate around food practices. I asked people to get educated on the problems of hunger and food insecurity and food injustice in their communities. I asked them to learn how to avoid foods that exploit workers and support environmental racism or that pump more plastic into landfills and oceans. And because I have to practice what I preach, I did some learning too, because it's really super easy for me to point my fingers at people who are eating turkeys but it is much harder to know that the decisions that I make about what I eat can also lack compassion, even if they're plant-based, because we don't know what we don't know, and we need to find out. So to close these Thanksgiving musings today, I invite each of us to think about one new area of knowledge we can stretch into. For example, I'm going to spend more time digging into this messy, entangled mess of conservation and ammunition and what I can do to try to make change in that area. If we each do this, think about it. Even though we're involved in all sorts of amazing things to start off with, come January, this community could have heaps of gratitude for making it through another year and doing the work we already do. But we could also have an impressive list of New Year's resolutions that we could share with each other, educating each other. And that could be good news for the turkeys that we continue to advocate so fiercely for. And it could also be good news for lots of other beings around us. So I hope you'll take me up on this challenge and I'll ask you about it again in January. Okay, over to you, William. Okay, thank you, thank you. So uh, I guess you probably all know that I'm Reverend William. And now is the time when we have our reading of our tenets of agreement, which are extremely important to us. We read them at the beginning of every service and they're found on our website. And so our reader for the tenants today will be Elaine Hutchinson. Now, Elaine is a copywriter, a Wix expert, and she's a longtime member of the Compassion Consortium spiritual team. And you've actually met her previously. She read the tenants previously but we're having her back today because she is a new engaged member and she's the person who will be doing our Compassion in Action interviews going forward. So Elaine and Phil, take it away. Thank you, Reverend William, for that lovely welcome. Um, our tenets of agreement, we acknowledge a divine force at the heart of the universe and in all living beings. We may refer to this force as God, but it is known by many names and appears in different forms or as formless. We recognize the common moral principles inherent within all wisdom traditions. We affirm that compassion, reverence for life, and nonviolence are fundamental to religious faith and moral philosophy and are to be extended to all sentient beings. 
We stand by these principles of inclusion, diversity, and equality, and hold these as essential in our human relations. We hold that non-human animals are imbued with the same essence of life and love as our human animals, and that there is moral parity between us. We avow that humans do not own the earth, its resources, or its inhabitants, but instead must be involved in their protection and care. We endeavor to eat and live in a kind and sustainable manner, moving away from animal foods and animal-derived clothing, as well as any activities that cause harm to our fellow beings, human or otherwise. We aim to provide spiritual comfort, fellowship, and food for thought to those practicing or exploring a vegan lifestyle. We offer guidance and peer support for all those seeking a more compassionate and spiritual life. And we commit to sharing these principles freely with humility and respect in support of non-human animals and the earth. Now is the time we always have a song of compassion. And, you know, it's, it's various artists and various themes. And today's song of compassion is, I, I think is very, very beautiful. Um, it's called Hope and open all. And I must admit, I practiced saying that correctly for like 10 minutes, and I hope I did not mess it up. But anyway, this was recommended by Ellie Sarti, who is one of our animal chaplain training students. And Hope and open all is a, it's, 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 it's a Hawaiian reconciliation ritual. Uh, so when two people or families or tribes are in conflict, they gather together and perform a rite to bring harmony to the discord. So hope and open all, the literal translation means to put two rights. And one modern day interpretation is, I am sorry, please forgive me. I love you, thank you. And this version is an arrangement by Baird Hersey and performed by the group Prana. So Phil, can you play this for us now? Oh, 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 no.
Thank you. Thank you, Reverend William. Thank you, Elaine, for reading the tenets. And thank you, Ellie Sarti, for that amazing uh, song, which is also a practice. So you're getting back to back spiritual practices today, which reminds me to tell you that Phil has finished putting together our interspecies spiritual practice library. I'm putting the link in the chat, which is amazing, on our YouTube channel uh, for Compassion Consortium. We now have a list of, I think, about 20. Uh, and we'll keep them going. The intention of these practices that we're offering to you and Erica offered you and now some other guests are offering is that you're able to take these away from the service. You're able to do them at different times during your month. They help provide grounding. They help provide different ways of connecting. Uh, so without further ado or commercial for the list of spiritual practices, I want to introduce you to Ginny Makita. Ginny is an attorney who has practiced and taught animal law since 1991. Prior to opening her own firm in West Michigan in 2000, she served as the in-house counsel at Farm Animal Rights Movement, PETA, and the Animal Legal Defense Fund. I guess that makes you a super lawyer, Ginny. Ginny is the founder of Animal Blessings, a nonprofit organization dedicated to honoring the sacred worth of all animals, from companion animals with whom we share our lives, to captive animals exploited by humans for food and clothing and entertainment, and wild animals who are hunted or at risk of extinction. So that makes you a super spiritual person too, Ginny, I think. She is currently enrolled in her second year at One Spirit Interfaith Interspiritual Seminary, as well as the Compassion Consortium's Animal Chaplaincy Training Program. So come June, she's gonna be a force to be reckoned with, mm -hmm. uh, an interfaith, interspiritual minister and an animal chaplain, although she's already engaged and has been for quite some time in animal chaplaincy. So Ginny, I'm gonna hand the floor over to you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also gonna put into the chat for folks who are collecting links today. Um, Ginny's website is animalblessings.love. Lots of great information there as well. All right, Thanks. Jenny, over to you. Thank you so much for inviting me to join you today. Um, Sarah's invitation uh, coincided with deer hunting season here in Michigan, which thankfully ends this Thursday, but not before, um, before allowing all of us in Michigan to bear witness to the sounds of gunshots permeating the air and sights of dead deer draped over cars, hanging out of trunks in the backs of pickups. I, I compiled a few facts to ground this meditation because I, I was interested in them and I thought you might be as well. Um, each year in the United States, 6 million deer are killed across the country. 364,000 of those are here in Michigan about uh, 1.5 million human deer accidents occur. And I couldn't find statistics about how many deer are killed or injured, but I did find that 200 humans and 10,000 injuries occur each year. Most of those occur during hunting season, which is also the mating season for white-tailed deer here in Michigan. A few interesting Michigan laws Hunters can kill up to 10 antler, antlerless deer, which include does and fawns. The minimum age to hunt was eliminated 10 years ago, and for $7.50, a child can kill a deer in what is a, a program called a mentored youth program. Blind hunters are permitted to hunt in Michigan. They use a laser sight used by military and law enforcement agencies to do that. 
Hunters cannot are not permitted to chase a wounded deer onto private property that is breaking the law. And finally, November 15th, which is opening day here, um, is called Deer Day or Christmas Day for hunters. And many of our 83 county school districts are closed to ensure that children don't miss the hunt. Um, as you might suspect, for folks like you and me, these two weeks are hell. And while a loving, a modified loving kindness uh, meditation is desperately needed, it's interesting when Sarah mentioned she was in the Galapagos Islands on uh, Thanksgiving of last year, I actually managed to be in the same place on opening day. And so I missed it last year and forgot just how horrible it is until I was here this year for it. So what I'd like to do now is, Phil, if you could put the picture up for me, the photo. Thank you. Now I invite you to close your eyes, sit comfortably with your feet flat on the floor and your spine straight. Relax your whole body and bring your awareness inward. Take the deepest breath you've taken all day in through your nose and out through your mouth. Now visualize the facts that I just shared with you, the horrifying facts. Imagine them being placed on a piece of dissolving paper. And now imagine dropping that piece of paper into a bowl of life-giving water made holy by its very existence. And then gently pouring the water and those facts at the base of your favorite tree. Now you may continue with your eyes closed or gently open them and gaze softly at the image on your screen as you listen with your hearts to these words. May dear, near and far, born in freedom and in, that, in captivity, be safe and protected from inner and outer harm. May dear be free of living in fear of human beings. May dear who are mourning their loved ones who have been injured or killed have their grief softened. May the deer find solace in the trees that bathe their breath and the meadows and forests that embrace them. May deer near and far experience ease of well being and peace. May hunters who support the violent killing of deer have their minds, hearts, and souls awakened and transformed by wisdom and compassion for the deer and all sentient beings. And may we, those present together on this call today, find forgiveness and peace nestled in our anger and grief. And may compassion and love encircle all the earth and beings of the wilderness, human and non-human, those who hunt and those who do not. May it be so. Ginny, may it be so. Thank you so much for offering this practice. And we'll make sure that uh, we have this up on that list on YouTube, because I feel like some of us may want to do this practice quite often over the next few weeks and when other seasons arise. Victoria, yes. we are all primed and prepped and ready for you. So oh, good, because I'm really excited. And I hope everybody else is Dr. Armighty May. She was the vegan veterinarian. We now have quite a few, but I remember when Dr. Armighty May seemed like the vegan veterinarian, and she is the vegan veterinarian of the hour for us today. Dr. Armighty, we could spend this whole time and then some talking about your religion or your profession 
or you. So we're going to try to uh, <laughs> touch on all three of those. And let, let's start with the intersection uh, between the two, which is you. How did you get to be a vegan veterinarian? Thank you for having me, Victoria. It's great to be here. I was raised vegetarian uh, because my grandfather witnessed a pig being slaughtered in Malaysia on the way from India to America. And from that point onward, vowed never again to eat land animals with his wife, my grandmother. And so I was raised on a lacto-ovo-vegetarian diet. Then when I learned more about what happened to the animals, I went vegan, reading a book called Diet for New America by John Robbins, which opened my eyes to the cruelty inflicted upon dairy cows and egg laying hens. I became a vegan activist uh, when I was at UC Berkeley in undergrad and then I started vet school and was quite alarmed to see that my classmates were not on the same page for the most part when it came to what they consider food animals, which to me is offensive, but that's how they're termed in the, the veterinary curriculum. But I was determined to bring awareness to the plight of these non-human animals, cows, chickens, turkeys, pigs, goats, etc., who are just as deserving as our dog and cat companions of compassion and respect. So I actually attended my first animal rights conference in 2001, right before starting vet school at UC Davis. And I put a bunch of locker stickers on my locker before the first day of classes, like love animals, don't eat them, protect farm animals, go vegan. And lo and behold, I was called into the Dean's office uh, six weeks into my first quarter of vet school because a classmate had complained that my locker stickers were offensive, which really stunned me. Long story short, I, I got through the four years. It was a challenge, a lot of tough nights. And besides the studying and the, the exams, there was a culture of lack of regard for people with uh, animal rights sympathies, you could say. Although some people started to gain more of a, a friendship with me over time there, but there were a lot of people who ostracized me or I was, I was sort of the black sheep, no pun intended. <laughs> that has I, uh, been very <laughs> difficult. Yeah. And so what's it like now? You are a practicing veterinarian. I hope you'll tell me that it's getting better. What's it like when you go to conferences, when you're with your colleagues? I think it is getting better gradually. Uh, now it's not so crazy and outrageous to say that that I'm vegan. Um, it used to be I would go to a, a conference and ask for a vegan meal and I would be told, oh, well, we can't make these special accommodations, you know, or, you know, after a lot of back and forth, it was just like white flour pasta or some really bland, boring meal. Now, generally, there's a little more effort put into having a decent vegan option at the, the various conferences. In fact, one of the conferences that I go to regularly, the Pitcairn Institute of Veterinary Homeopathy annual homeopathy conference, all the food is vegan, which is amazing. So I love that. And uh, I've found a lot of veterinarians are starting to gravitate towards a plant-based diet. I started the organization VAPA, a veterinary association for the protection of animals back in 2015 with the express purpose to bring awareness to the benefits of a vegan lifestyle through documentary screening events and done a number of those. And one of the events that I held several years back screening the film Peaceable Kingdom, a veterinarian in attendance decided to go vegan because of watching that film. So that was a, a really nice outcome. And she actually mentioned to me that no one had ever asked her how she felt about what animals go through. And that really made her think about that because in vet school, a lot of times we're just in this left brain mode of memorizing and regurgitating facts and figures. And of course we have to do a lot of that just to learn what we need to know, but there's not as much emphasis on what do we actually feel about what's happening to the animals. So I thought that was really poignant. Did you have to do any work, any kind of internship with farmed animals, do you just have a sense of what it's like to be a doctor who is trying to save someone's life, but knowing that that being is doomed? It's just hard to wrap my head around it. 
it was really challenging in vet school to have those slaughterhouse uh, images projected. I mean, I was privy to that information going in beforehand and even since then doing reviews of undercover videos, but watching just the way they phrase terms like uh, withdrawal time for, for slaughter uh, as a standard protocol for any kind of farmed animal, that discouraged me from really pursuing that as a, an area of focus. Uh, a lot of the people who were interested in that, they, they were interested in what's known as food animal medicine. Uh, they, they don't see the dogs and cats in the same way. It's somehow they're compartmentalizing them in two different categories. So that was challenging to confront. And I think some of the people did struggle with it, but ultimately the peer pressure was so strong that they felt pressured into just going along with, with the standard uh, way they were talking about the animals. And I, you know, I was one of the more outspoken ones in vet school. So that's why I got my share of pushback from some of my classmates about it. But uh, to me, it was more important to speak my truth and, and be a voice for the voiceless. And I think that as time goes on, it just becomes more apparent that that's how I can really make a difference is to continue to speak my truth, no matter how you know objectionable it might be, or if it's considered offensive. Well, sometimes the truth hurts, but we have to still get it out there. Yes. So when you founded BAPA, and part of at least the mission of that, as I understand it, is to promote compassionate veterinary care, compassionate choices in how we care for companion animals and other uh, animals um, whose decisions we're making for them. So what does that mean exactly? Yeah, so there is a, a reverence for life philosophy that the vet school in Pomona, Western University College of Veterinary Medicine embraces. So that means they don't have any harmful or terminal use of animals in their curriculum. And VAPA's mission, in addition to raising awareness about veganism, is also to encourage those sorts of programs at other vet schools. Uh, for example, the Body Will Donation Program that Western University has where when animals are euthanized for humane medical reasons, their guardians can elect to donate their pets remains for vet students to learn about anatomy and pathology and all that that they need to know uh, without having to take the lives of healthy animals in the process. So uh, hopefully as time goes on, uh, vet students will become more aware that these humane alternatives exist. And our website has a lot of resources, vapavets.org for pre-vet students and vet students who are interested in exploring those options and hopefully presenting them to the schools that they're attending. Wonderful. So now let's talk a little bit about being a Zoroastrian. It's such an old faith and yet its numbers have become very small in modern times. So tell us something about the philosophy and teachings of Zoroastrianism. Absolutely. Zoroastrianism is the ancient monotheistic faith that originated in Persia around 7000 BC. So it's the oldest monotheistic religion to believe in one God. We believe in good thoughts, good words, and good deeds. And part of that is showing respect and compassion to animals who we share this earth with. Uh, we're called upon to show compassion to animals. In fact, there's a whole month devoted to animal welfare. Um, every month has a different name. And uh, there's a Baman, a Mesh husband, who's uh, an assistant to God, or Ahura Mazda, as we call God in Zoroastrianism, whose job it is to look after animals. So traditionally, Zoroastrians are called to only eat vegetarian food during the month of Baman. There are also days during every month that are specifically uh, days to abstain from eating meat, baman, more, roj, and gosh, ram, gosh, and, and more, rather, in addition to baman, roj. So those are some of the, the basic principles. Now, not every Zoroastrian, of course, is vegetarian or vegan. A lot of them are not, uh, but there, there are a few who are, and hopefully more will um, 
gravitate towards that. I, I've done some screenings of documentaries such as A Prayer for Compassion um, in the Zoroastrian circles as well. And you know, some people have been affected enough to make decisions to, to change their diets. But you know, it's a gradual process, just like any other community. It can take um, repeated efforts. I used to do vegan cooking classes as well with one of the Zoroastrian groups that I used to circle around with, but that, that's been um, a while ago that that was, but yeah, I mean, there are many ways that people can get involved in their local religious or spiritual communities, uh, regardless of what your faith is. I think all these religions have the same core basic tenets, and that's outlined in uh, Thomas Jackson's film, A Prayer for Compassion, which I recently showed uh, for a VAPA screening and dinner that I hosted uh, just a, a few weeks ago here in Santa Monica. <laughs> Wonderful. We know Thomas Jackson. Uh, so tell us a little bit about the founder of, of Zoroastrianism. How much is known about him? Zarathustra, also known as Zoroaster, is the founder. And he. there were many miracles that happened uh, that were quite amazing of, of him um, healing people. And he, he came as the first prophet to introduce the idea of belief in one God. And so before that, uh, there was idol worship. So it was, it was really groundbreaking. And, and that's, uh, there's a special prayer I thought I might share with the audience that uh, goes like this, Ustano Zato Atravio Spitamo Zaratustro. And that translates to, at the birth of Zaratustra, all of nature rejoiced and exclaimed, blessed are we that the prophet Spitama Zaratustra is born. So let us follow in Zarathustra's footsteps and be a cause for all of nature to rejoice. Oh, that's beautiful. So when you hear good thoughts, good words, good deeds, how does that come across to you? I'm sure that it, it speaks very differently to different people. So when you think of those three things, what comes to mind? What do you do in a day when you're really thinking about those precepts? I think about showing compassion to animals, uh, being kind to animals and to people, as well as being honest and truthful, uh, staying true to my values, having awareness of the environment around me, being mindful of the impact that I'm having on the environment, which is also important in Zoroastrianism, that we not defile the environment or pollute it unnecessarily. In fact, there's a, a special method of disposal, at least traditionally, of uh, the remains of deceased Zoroastrians, which involves no harmful impact on the environment, uh, which may have you know, different interpretations and not everyone adheres to it nowadays. But in the ancient times, uh, they would actually put the bodies on top of a mountaintop and vultures would come and consume the, the human remains. And that way there was no waste or uh, defilement of the environment uh, with any kind of toxic chemicals. So um, I just, I try to be mindful of recycling, cleaning properly, not wasting food, being observant of uh, the amount of trash that I'm producing, trying to be um, as considerate of, of others as I can um, while still maintaining my goals and you know pursuing what I need to do so yeah it's it's like considering that I'm a part of a big universe and I'm just one small piece of that but it's important to me to do my part to make the world a better place uh, we also have a concept called the humanu which means good mind and that has to do with using one's own critical thinking and analyzing situations to really determine what is right and wrong and, and not just taking everything at face value, but questioning things. Love that. So one of our um, attendees uh, has said, of course, many of us would like to hear Dr. May talk about veganism for dogs. Yes. So <laughs> what about veganism for dogs? I'm so glad you asked. There is actually a scientific study that's going to be released very soon that delved into the health of dogs on plant-based diets. It was conducted by Dr. Tonatil Melgarejo and Annika Linda at Western University College of Veterinary Medicine in Pomona, California. 
and we'll be finding out more details in the near future. There are a lot of other studies that also show that dogs can thrive and prosper on a plant-based diet, provided it's nutritionally complete and adequate. So they do need certain amounts of protein, calories, fats, carbohydrates, vitamins, minerals. And dogs on plant-based diets actually have fewer skin allergies because uh, the two top food allergens for dogs are beef and chicken. So by adhering to a plant-based diet, they're not getting those allergenic substances that can lead to itching, scratching, biting, et cetera. Another benefit is avoidance of a lot of bioaccumulated toxins that are present in pretty much all meats, whether they're poultry, fish, uh, there's tons of arsenic in chicken, for example, mercury in most seafood, and all kinds of bioaccumulated carcinogens, whether they're um, plastics that you know bioaccumulate up the food chain, glyphosate, uh, dioxins, PCBs, all kinds of petrochemicals that get into the bloodstreams of animals and then concentrate in their tissues. So for dogs to be healthiest, they really should have a, a low intake of those toxic ingredients. And since they are, uh, uh, they are omnivores, not carnivores, and they have the genes for digestion of grains, they, they can do so much more so than their wolf ancestors. In fact, uh, they can do very well on plant-based diets. Now there are certain breeds that have to be observed with more care in regards to their urinary tract health. And that goes for whether they're plant-based or meat-based. Uh, for example, miniature schnauzers, Lhasa Opsos, Cocker Spaniels, and, and other breeds can be prone to struvite crystals in their urine, which can lead to stones if they're not addressed. But this is something that has to do with a urinary tract infection predisposition the dogs, those particular breeds can have. And so by having their urine monitored and also making sure they're getting plenty of hydration, water intake is crucial to avoid those UTIs and consequently avoiding the crystals. Uh, that's something that you know those dogs can also do well on the vegan diets provided their urinary tract health is monitored. Now, certain other breeds can have issues with lack of taurine. Um, dogs can usually manufacture their own taurine through the two amino acids, methionine and cysteine that are present in plant-based ingredients. But if they need additional taurine, sometimes a supplement may be warranted. And there are a lot of commercially available vegan dog foods that do have taurine already in them. Any resources you would recommend on that, uh, on sure. any of this uh, vegan dog? <laughs> yeah, so there's a website, plantbased.dog. It has some links to a few of the scientific articles that I mentioned, including one from the Environmental Resource Group that shows the level of, of toxic heavy metals present in the blood and urine of dogs eating conventional diets is alarmingly high, uh, more so than you would even find in a human uh, eating a conventional meat-based diet. Uh, so plantbased.dog, it also has veterinarians who endorse plant-based diets for dogs. There are about a dozen of us on there who have uh, publicly endorsed plant-based nutrition for dogs. And uh, Dr. Andrew Knight has also done some really great work. In fact, he released a study of his own uh, not long ago. And he's based in the UK. He's a friend of mine. And his website is veggiepets.info, V-E-G-E-P-E-T-S.info. Oh, thank you so much. We'll put those in the, in the chat as well. So I want to get into an area of a little bit of controversy. I know that there are some people whose concerns for animals are such that they believe that there is something ethically off with even living with companion animals. And other people have concerns about spaying and neutering, which a lot of us are out there saying, spay, neuter. And other people are saying, uh, not so fast. You're interfering with a very personal, profound life experience for these animals. So where do you come down on some of those hotter topics. <laughs> Thank you for bringing those up. I, I think they're worth discussing. I have spent time in a number of shelters over the years seeing dogs caged up in these kennel facilities. And it's really heartbreaking to see that. Uh, I really wish people would not purposely breed dogs or cats for the sake of their 
companionship. In particular, certain particular breeds such as French Bulldogs and Bulldogs in general. In fact, any dog who has a brachycephalic or short nose, uh, it makes their life very challenging to go through life that way, not having a proper airway. And they, they end up having a lot of issues down the road, which are heartbreaking for their guardians to have to deal with in addition to the dog suffering. So I do think that there, there ought to be limits on breeding. Um, but in the meantime, because that hasn't happened, uh, there are so many wonderful dogs who are not allowed to live. They are being killed in shelters and elsewhere for lack of homes. And that is unacceptable. So if that's gonna be happening, I, I don't wanna allow any further reproduction of animals to the extent that I am able to contribute to, to that being solved. And for me, spaying and neutering is an ethical and effective way to curb the reproduction of these animals when there aren't sufficient homes for them. I mean, I can't even tell you how many people are contacting me. Oh, can you find a home for this dog, this cat I found, there's a stray animal in my yard, etc. I hear it all the time. And I try to help as best as I can, but there are only so many people, so many homes, so many people who are willing to take in these animals. And whatever we can do as responsible guardians to curb that issue, or to bring awareness to people to say, listen, if you're interested in having an animal in your home, why not adopt from a shelter or a rescue organization and save a life rather than contributing to the breeding of animals uh, that, that is just perpetuating this whole cycle. So uh, there are also he health benefits to spaying and neutering for a female dog, for example, the spay prevents mammary cancer if it's done early in life. It eliminates the risk of pyometra, which is an infection of the uterus that can be life-threatening. And I've seen dogs actually die of this condition in practice. Uh, when I worked at an emergency facility some time back, there were dogs that came in with that from time to time. And if the surgery isn't done promptly enough uh, because the bacterial toxins build up in the uterus, uh, they, they can get septic and, and pass on, unfortunately. So it's, it's a life-saving procedure in that sense. Uh, for males, of course, it reduces some of the undesirable behaviors that make them difficult to live with, like humping, marking, also running away um, in search of a mate. If the dog is spayed or neutered, uh, or the cat, uh, less likely to get into fights with other animals, more likely to be calm, content, and, and a, a better companion. Um, I, I do recognize some people have an ethical issue with it, and there, there are so many ethical issues that we can go into and, and dissect. But I'm a practical person. At the end of the day, I look at what, what can we do, practically speaking, that's actually going to make a difference. And from what I can see, having an animal in, a, in my home, while it may not be the most natural thing, if, if that animal is not in my home or in someone else's, where is that animal going to be? And how well is that animal going to be cared for? If he or she is in the wild, well, there are predators, there are hunters, as we've learned about. There are all kinds of things that are not safe for them and they can end up having you know, parasitism even. I've volunteered in other countries where I've seen dogs get covered with ticks and be just rail thin, completely malnourished from lack of nutrients because they're just stray dogs, not getting the right food, not getting the right care. And it's really hard to see that. I mean, it, I mean, they're suffering and they're in that condition. So having a dog or a cat in one's home, well cared for, while it may not be the most natural thing, I think it's it's a reasonable compromise. And they've they've been domesticated now for over ten thousand years, so they're very well suited to being in our home environments. Now, there are certain animals that I I have more of a concern with having as a pet, like say certain birds that are really more designed to be in the jungle, you know, and they can end up with these stereotypic behaviors from feather picking. Parrots, for example, tend to do that when they're distressed. Certainly dogs and cats can also experience stress, which can be remedied through veterinary interventions, holistic flower essences, and, and various other treatments that can be given to help these animals cope with these issues. So 
that we can improve the quality of their lives to the extent that we can do that. Thank you so much, Dr. Armighty May. You're not only a vegan vet, you're an angel for animals. Thank you for all you do. I know you need to leave us now and go help um, some people in the homeless community with their animals. So God bless you for that. And thank you for spending this time with us. My pleasure. God bless you too. Thank you so much. All the best. Reverend Sarah. Wow, that was a lot of information and some fabulous links, which I've had a couple of chats about, about uh, how do I get these links that have been going in the chat? So Phil has promised us that he's going to be putting them in the replay uh, on YouTube when we post the replay. So we'll start doing that every week. I think that's a great practice for, for those of you who are listening fully with wonderful intent and not seeing what's going on in the chat. So next, uh, we're over to Elaine. For compassion and action. Thank you, Reverend Sarah. Uh, today, we're so fortunate to have um, someone who's been mentioned several times already today, uh, Thomas Wade Jackson. He's an extraordinary voice for compassion. Um, he's a filmmaker, a musician, and an animal activist. And his 2019 film, A Prayer for Compassion, um, it's a film he created with our own Victoria Moran, helped give birth to where we are today, this Compassion Consortium. So welcome, Thomas. We're always so glad to have you here. Oh, it's such a privilege and honor to be here, and especially with all my friends. And I love that I could make it here today. Thanks for inviting me. Ah, uh, well, we're, we're grateful. Um, you have several projects in the works. You have a docu-series, a short film, and a CD on the way. So let's talk about your new docu-series. Uh, it's to be released in early 2003, I believe, and it's called Compassion in Action, Bringing the Elixir Home. In that film, how do you explore compassion? Well, you know, basically uh, it picks up where we left off after Prayer for Compassion, literally, like we're in the woods singing the song that we ended the Prayer for Compassion with. And it just takes us on the journey of taking the film, film around. We start with the preview at the first Vegan World 2026 uh, get, or gathering. And, you know, so, and then from there we go on and on and uh, take the film. I get to go back to India for three weeks and we get to go all around the United States and Melody gets to go to the London premiere and, and Scotland and Paris. And so it's a lot of fun. And uh, also along the way, we get to explore uh, uh, animal sanctuaries and uh, visuals like pig visuals. We went, got to go to that in marches and demonstrations. And, um, and I got to explore different topics with people that we met along the way. Uh, I got to talk about um, effective communication for activists with uh, vegan psychologist Claire Mann. And, uh, and I got to talk, uh, one of the things I didn't get to go through or we didn't get to cover in A Prayer for Compassion that I always wanted to explore was self-compassion because it's such an important thing. So um, in the docu-series, we get to talk a little bit about self-compassion, self-care and uh, Melanie Joy talks a little bit about that ritual, I think speaks some. And so uh, we see examples of compassion and uh, there's not a, it's really like there's, I don't think there's any main, any kind of uh, graphic violence other than I go, I did go to a wet market in India. And uh, so there's a little bit there, but it's not like, uh, you know, we really try, I mean, to me, it's like, it's a love letter to activism and activists. I met so many amazing activists along the journey. So I wanted to give something back to them like that sings their praises and also gives them maybe some tips on um, how to communicate and really how to take care of themselves. Because I think activists tend to put the purpose ahead of self-care sometime. And uh, I think that makes us a, le a little less effective. So aside from living um, a healthier life with self-care, how does that compassionate self-care help change the world in activism? Well, you know, I think uh, there's on several levels. I think on the first level, um, I have a belief that we're all connected, that all things are connected, that there's an energy that runs through all things. And so when you are taking care of yourself and you're meditating and pray, you know, edit, uh, exercising and sleeping and getting good food and all of these things 
I feel like your energy level is is um, your well being, your energy level is is a lot higher, and mm -hmm. you're open to to uh, you make the world around you better because we're all connected. But also, you become open more to your creative connection and to your divine purpose and guidance. I feel like. And so uh, I feel whatever you're here to do by taking care of yourself, it makes you more effective at it. And um, and it seems like you're taking time away from it. It's almost like when you go to exercise, you think, well, it's going to take energy to exercise. Well, it builds energy. And it's like when you're you when you exercise that creativity and that and all of those things within you, when you take time to to do things that feed your soul, you know, um, it comes out in other ways and it allows you to be more present when you go back to whatever that work is to whatever the activism is and i think uh that's the other level and the other the third level i think is that it it's an example for others i think whether the person's vegan not vegan whatever when they when they come around someone who has an energy and they're comfortable in their skin and they and they're loving and they're kind it really uh they feel it and and it kind of uh inspires them i mean we really don't know you know who we're inspiring and who sees i mean there's been so many people in my life that i don't even know like i saw them do something and it affected me and i changed my behavior and then i you know later on the road i saw somebody notice me do it and change their behavior so you just i think it's important to realize we don't know who we are uh, affecting so the more we take care of ourselves and be a good example um and the better we feel, the better the universe is going to feel. That's kind of my answer. It's beautiful. So one final question, Thomas. Um, what can one person do today in their own version of compassion and action to make the world a better place? Or well, an action that, that truly makes the world a better place? What can one person do? Uh, if there's one action, I would just say meditation would be the first action. Because it basically... For me, if you start with the meditation, you find the guidance to lead you to the other actions, you know, but uh, if I would go a little further, I would say self-care and self-compassion for the reasons we talked about and also making time to do that thing that feeds your soul, that's creative, that I know you feel you don't have time to do, but your heart's calling you to do, and you don't see how it's connected to your purpose, you know, and all of these things, I, I feel like even if it doesn't look directly connected to your purpose by following that it leads you so you just open so many doors of creativity and i feel like the answers and the change that's going to happen is going to come through creative you know through our creativity through our imaginations and uh, breaking because we have to we we have to shift the world is shifting you know it it's warms my heart to go to a store and see so many vegan options growing every time I go and realize that, you know, these are not all vegans. These are people who are pre-vegans that are becoming more and more open to it. Well, thank you, Thomas. And let's hope there's many more on the way. And thank you for your time today. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you, Thomas. Wow, so much today. We've considered challenges facing a lot of different species. I've noted so far turkeys, deer, dogs, cats, pigs, pigeons, and humans. If I missed anyone, sorry, throw it in the chat for me when we get to blessings and prayers here. Uh, so I'm going to ask Phil to go ahead and open the chat for a minute. As we go back into what do we do from a spiritual perspective? We have parrots and parrots. Thank you, Victoria. I know all of a sudden species are just going to come. I've opened the floodgates and they'll all come flying into the chat. Have at it, folks. But what can we do from a spiritual perspective? You know, so let's take a deep breath together. And we go back from the place of listening and the place of our ears and the place of our eyes watching into a frame of spiritual practice, of meditation, of mindful prayer, of blessings, of good wishes of loving kindness, whatever language it is, it's familiar for you. Okay, and Phil, if you could please bring up Agnetha McCormick on screen with me. We are gonna spotlight a blessing that Agnetha created. Agnetha is joining us from over in Scotland, which is why it's a little darker there than it is where, where I am. And she's one of our aspiring animal chaplains. So can you tell me, Agnetha, tell us a little bit about this blessing before we play it. Well, because I'm Swedish originally, I 
always communicate with animals in Swedish. And I'm saying, well, my cat, he only speaks Swedish. So it's kind of also, I have to get my head around what blessings are and the meanings of them. And then I thought, well, the person or the, the being I'm with the most is the, my cat, who's just appeared in the doorway here as well now. And um, so I thought I need to, I need to make it about him or for for him and um the only way i can catch him as well is when he, in a certain mood so that's usually in my messy bed perfect right the messy comfortable bed agnetha you hit on something really important there this practice of blessings and and prayers that we do if we can start it in our own homes if we can do this as a daily way of doing something, then it makes it easy to extend it and extend it and extend it, extend it. Um, now, I, I love listening to the Swedish for one other reason as well. Um, first, because my great aunts were Swedish. And so there's a little bit of kind of warmness here. But also for everyone else here, we can hear the love. We can hear the compassion. We can hear what's in a blessing, I think, differently in listening to Agnetha's than we might if we were focusing on the words, except for those of you who speak Swedish. So <laughs> Phil, I'm gonna ask you to uh, to take Agnetha and I out of the hot seat here and bring uh, her lovely, fabulous. And I'm gonna ask before you play that, everyone just goes again to that place of deep breath. And think of the beings that you live with, the beings around you, the beings you might cohabitate with, your furry family members or animal companions, whatever language is comfortable to you. What might it be like to do a practice similar to this when you see them in their comfort, comfort spot on your messy bed? Okay, Phil, go ahead. Hey, I love that. I can't stop watching it. There's that moment at the end where you stop and the eyes just kind of open, like, keep going, lady. <laughs> or at least that's the idea that I like to put in your cat's head. Can you share with us uh, a translation of generally what you were saying there? Yes. Um, so I start with, um, may your life be full of joy. May your life be full of love. And may your life be full of everything that you enjoy and that is fun and that's enjoyable. Um, may your life be full of peace. Amen. So from that place of sweetness, folks, I invite you to enter into the chat today, a moment of sweetness, a moment of blessing for someone around you. A moment from that, we're often in that, that difficult, heartbroken space. But any blessings from that sweet, sweet spot? I'm going to offer to my cat Deacon. May you know when your belly is full. <laughs> so that perhaps when I come in after this session, uh, there won't be the incessant asking me to open the food cabinet. So if anyone can think of any... Ah, beautiful. We have some coming in from Debbie and the Gang of Fur. Hmm, yes, bless the being whose remains Shale and I found by the river today. Yes. And with that, Debbie transitions us from that place of sweetness for the living to sweetness for those who've passed on. So I invite you to place into the chat either moments of sweetness or moments of heartbreak and blessings for the people and the animals near and dear to you. Perhaps the 46 million turkeys who were slaughtered last week, needlessly, in my opinion. 
to those who were injured, killed, or involved in the recent shootings in Atlanta, Nashville, New Orleans, Mobile, Chicago, Houston, Colorado Springs, and 32 other shootings of humans this month alone. Perhaps the deer that are being shot that uh, Ginny so beautifully told us how to extend compassion for any of these. And I see in the chat, the women in Iran, blessings to the precious deer and the precious turkeys, those suffering in the cold in Ukraine. For all of these, for all of the blessings that you are naming, the ones that are in your head that aren't making it into the chat. And for anyone who we're not sure of their needs right now, that they be offered compassion. For thunder, may your life be full of joy. May your life be full of love. May you have everything you enjoy. May you experience peace. Hmm. Just take a couple deep breaths there. And Judy Carmen reminds us of the words that many of us say every day at noon in the prayer circle of compassion. If I got the words right on that. Compassion encircles the earth for all beings. But that is our vision. Taking one more deep breath together, and I thank Agnetha for her sweetness and her beautifulness and willing to share and step up here uh, today to be with us from far away, but not so feeling not so far away. And Phil, if you could bring up our final prayer. And as we do this, as we say these words together that we say together every week, again, taking a deep, deep breath. Connecting to that which is deep within us or outside of us, that which we direct our spirituality to or we receive our spirituality from. May all creatures everywhere be happy and free. May the thoughts, words, and actions of our life contribute to this happiness and this freedom for all. May it be so. Amen. So won't it be. Thank you everyone for another amazing Sunday service here. We have some wonderful announcements for what's coming up. So please stick around for the announcements. We've moved our December spiritual service to December 18th, which is the third Sunday. So, so that we don't conflict with holiday vacations. And our special spiritual guest on December 18th will be Reverend Dr. Christopher Carter. Dr. Carter's research, teaching, and activist interests are in Black, womanist, and environmental ethics, with a particular focus on race, food, and non-human animals. So also on December 18th, our blessings and prayers will be delivered by Sarah Eifler in recognition of the beginning of Hanukkah. Sarah is the Director of Programming for Jewish Veg. She holds a BA from Brandeis University and is a current rabbinic student at the Alliance for Jewish Renewal. She's also a member of the Compassion Consortium Advisory Board. So the next night on December 19th will be our engaged members gathering and Reverend Sarah will lead us in an interspecies menorah lighting and meditation on dedication. On January 26th, our special guest will be Tavoria Callum, a vegan follower of the Baha'i faith. And we will be exploring with her, her journey from being an atheist and a communist to her becoming a member of the Baha'i faith and its intersection with veganism. Then we have a special event coming up on Sunday, January 29th. The Pittsburgh Vegan Society and the Compassion Consortium will co-sponsor a vegan wellness conference featuring speakers and panel discussions on a variety of topics. Victoria and I will participate as well as Lisa Levinson and Judy Carmen from the Interfaith Vegan Coalition. Sean Moundis from the PVS, who is one of our members, um, we'll be posting more information on this soon, and we will include this in our December newsletter. And so lastly, have you been looking for vegan love in all the wrong places? That is a constant issue with vegans. So if you join us 
for our February book night at 8 p.m. February 9th, we will be featuring the co-author of Vegan Love Dating and Partnering for the Cruelty-Free Gal with Fashion, Makeup, and Wedding Tips. And we will be including additional information and registration information in our next newsletter, first week of December. So that's what's coming up. And if you enjoyed this service and want to support future Compassion Consortium programming, we encourage you to donate on our website at the link that Sarah's posting in the chat. We have never turned down a donation. So, you know, if you'd like to, please do so. And then don't forget to check out our membership program. All the details are on our website at the website address that Sarah is posting. So in addition to the membership benefits described on our website, as a member, you will receive my incredibly insightful and sometimes very humorous posts. So I think that is all for me, Sarah. You take it away. Thanks for joining us for Sunday service. We'll see you next month.